Well, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Steve Harridge. I'm from King's College London. Um, what I'm hoping to do this evening is challenge your perceptions about ageing. Um, and I'm going to acknowledge my colleague and friend, Professor Norman Lazarus, who's been working for many years on various aspects relating to muscle biology and ageing generally. And you'll be seeing him again in various guises throughout the presentation. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming. I'm going to conclude. Uh, it's been a long day, so I'm going to give my talk in reverse. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Yes, a ripple of applause there. So what I'm going to do in my conclusion is flag up some statements, and hopefully for the rest of the presentation, you'll be convinced that these conclusions are valid. Aging is not a disease, and thus by definition cannot be cured. It can, however, be optimized where poor function, often ascribed to just aging, is suboptimal. And this gives rise to the impression that we can somehow reverse it. The vast majority of the population are not on their optimal aging trajectory, but are at increased risk of increased periods of morbidity, as we've already heard from Tina. Increased longevity. Now, this is a word that we can talk about, what we mean by longevity. Um, as soon as I see the words 50, number 50 in the context of longevity, that gets, gets me worried because I'm thinking I'm still young. Um, but in the absence of equivalent health span, I'm not interested in longevity. I'm actually interested in maximizing the health span of people, not making people live to 200. And I'm going to hopefully convince you exercise is the ultimate poly pill. If it was a pharmaceutical agent, everyone would be taking one. That's not my words, that's the chief medical officer's words. So, some basic stats, and we've already heard some from Tina already. A uh, child born in the UK today can expect to live nearly 80 years for males and 83 for females. And we can see here, as I just go through these, I won't spend time because we've really seen these projections, although it's beginning to flatten out. But basically, we've cured infant mortality. Average lifespan is increasing. Maximal human lifespan. The few that live to 100, 105, 110, is not really increasing. However, this extra lifespan, as, as Tina's already alluded to, is not being accompanied by commensurate years of health span. So we have increased periods of morbidity at the end of life, which is not good. So what is aging? Let's get back to basics. These are really tough things to actually uh, define. We talk about as a noun, words decay, decline, senescent, senility, are not particularly attractive words when you look at <laughs> declining, deteriorating, long in the tooth, mellowing, senescent, senile. It all doesn't sound particularly good when you think about the context of aging, but I'm hopefully going to show you data that doesn't need to necessarily be like this. How do we study the biology of aging? Very difficult in humans because we live a relatively long time. So we can use these animals, Drosophila, C. elegans, transgenic animals. We can study these, but they're not humans. We're all different biological species. Well, what about humans? How can we study aging processes in humans? Well, we can study cells. Is this, yeah, is that actually working? No, okay. We can study cells, we have aging diseases. That's not aging, it's actually a disease. Uh, critical illness, if you're very unlucky to be in critical illness in an intensive care unit, you have dramatic changes to the body. Microgravity, going up into the International Space Station is viewed as an accelerated aging process. So what happens to us when we get old? Well, we can run through a series of features. Our bones become more brittle, that's not good. Osteoporosis, risk of fractures. Our hearts don't beat as fast. Our exercise capacity is reduced. Uh, joints become stiffer, we get arthritis. We get changes in our hormones. We get the menopause in females. Testosterone declines in males. Uh, our immune system becomes less efficient. We're less responsive to flu vaccinations. And my particular interest is in skeletal muscle, which is the most interesting tissue in the body. Um, become, they become smaller and weaker. We have this term sarcopenia to describe that. Lots of functional implications, including increased risk of falls. Well, let's take that muscle just as an idea of what we see as this trajectory of aging. We've got age on the bottom there. Uh, on the y-axis, we have strength. But we could put other physiological functions in there. And the basic idea is that as you grow into adulthood, you become stronger, you reach some kind of peak, and thereafter there's this progressive decline. Uh, we shouldn't actually assume that we decline in a straight line. That's another important point. What I've got there in the gold line that runs across there is this concept of threshold for independence. So in other words, there's a certain amount of force or power, they're different things, 
that your muscle needs to produce for you to do simple physical tasks, rising from a chair being one. There'll come a point where you cross that point. Your strength has gone down, so you're crossing that line, and now you can't do those things independently. And of course, we have many people who are hovering. They're just about okay, but they may trip, stumble, they fall, they've got brittle bones, they fracture a hip, they go into hospital, and then on this decline, and many, of course, never come out. So what we really want to do is, what can we do to push that slope up and to the right? What's the cause of this loss of muscle function? Well, if we take an MRI, magnetic resonance image, a slice, picture slice through the thigh, you've got a 31-year-old woman in the top, you've got an 85-year-old woman mm -hmm. at the bottom, you can see what the issue is. You've got a loss of tissue mass. So the dark gray is the contractile bit of muscle. The fat is around the periphery, and you've got an infiltration of fat and connective tissue around the, uh, in, impeding that muscle. If we study bits of muscle from people, which we do regularly in my lab, and we can study the more microscopic level, at the bottom you see nice rounded muscle fibers in cross-section when you salami slice up the muscle. But here's an example of an older person's muscle. You've got connective tissue, the red is fat. The quality of that muscle, not only its size, is being reduced. What are the mechanisms causing this sarcopenic process? We could have a four hour lecture on that. One issue is that we are in a more inflamed state. This concept of inflammation, we have chronic low grade inflammation. So markers such as IL-6, TNF alpha elevated in the blood. And then um, I'll certainly be testing everyone on this slide next, um, which is basically a slide to talk about, this is inside the cell, that's outside the cell the numerous factors that are going into controlling how your muscle is basically behaving, its size, and so on and so forth. And I can highlight these two factors, how they're playing a role within that um, scheme. I'm gonna come back to inflammation in a second. So, many of you remember, may remember the royal family. Because we have this issue when we're studying aging. Who do we study? We talked about which species do we study. But what type of human being do we study if we want to understand something about the biology of human aging. Well, could we study this gentleman, Jim Royal from the Royal Family? Spends most of his time sitting down, watching TV, drinking Guinness, smoking, eating badly, and being unpleasant to his family. Sadly, a reflection of a large number of people in society. But is that a model of aging? I'd say that it's not a model of aging. At the other end of the continuum, you've got people like this, who are into very late life, who are still competitive athletes. So we have this continuum of exercise. Now, most studies of aging and the problems that we're talking about in terms of a growing older population and their healthcare needs pertain to this side, not to this side. So if we want to understand the biology of aging, we've got to get rid of a lot of these negative factors that are confounders. Inactivity is a big confounder. We should put a health warning on studies of aging. Not we studied a group of 70-year-olds or a group of 80-year-olds. Well, what were those 78-year-olds like? Who were they? What was their physiology? Now, I apologize to you right now, because this is a quite depressing graph for those of you sitting down. So what it's basically showing is your risk of all-cause mortality. So basically, things are good if you have high cardiorespiratory fitness, if you have a high level of moderate to vigorous physical activity, and you spend very little time sitting. Conversely, if you spend a lot of time sitting, you're in big trouble. It's an independent risk factor for your all-cause mortality. Just sitting down. So I'm really sorry. Don't sue me. Um, but I'm negatively affecting your health just by making you sit down for the next 15, 20 minutes. Let's look at the other end of the, the human continuum. So this is A.V. Hill. So he was professor of physiology at UCL many years ago as a Nobel Prize winner. And back in 1925, he said, in the study of the physiology of muscular exercise, there is a vast store of accurate information in the records of athletic sports and racing. So we can understand a bit about how the body behaves by just looking at its performance. Now, many of you may study uh, aging research. One of the clinical measures might be a get up and go test, a six minute walk test, okay? For the people that I'm gonna talk about later, these are irrelevant tests. This is a whole body, physiological test, that's a 100 meter sprint and the 10,000 meters. So these are world record performances. So the best ever achieved by a human. So what this is saying to us is, no surprise, there's an aging process. The times are getting slower. 
we are getting older. And in fact, there's a very interesting where those arrows are, for whether it's 100 meters or 10,000 meters on the track, a break point where you get around your mid-70s and suddenly it gets a, loss wor a, a lot worse. Is this kind of a silhouette of our aging process? That whatever we do, we're kind of going to accelerate our decline. This is the best that we've ever done as a human. So what's new in this thinking? So there's nothing new. You go back to Hippocrates. That which is used develops. That which is new, not used wastes away. If there is any deficiency in food or exercise, the body will fall sick. That could be on the front page of the NHS website and no one would question it, and quite rightly so. More recently, there's another physiologist from UCL when teaching his medical students. And one of the problems with teaching medicine is everyone is sick rather than how they prevent them from getting sick. Exercise is not a mere variant of the condition of rest. It is the essence of the machine. We were designed not to sit down, eat pizza and donuts and watch 10 hours of box sets. We were designed, the body's designed to move around. And as Frank Booth more recently said, our genes evolved with the expectation of requiring a certain threshold of physical activity. So basically, being physically active, eating well, that is your default position for health across the lifespan. And if you're not doing those things, then you're not going to age optimally. So Norman and myself published a paper, and this is the kind of the abstract bit. They said, well, OK, we, we need to do some exercise. How much exercise do we need to do? Well, we've got government guidelines, but a bit of a, you know, a, bit of a guesstimate. How much do we need to do? I don't know. So we came up with the idea that you've got a red, a green, and a gold zone. We're extrapolating the idea that in physiology you have set points, like your blood pressure is trying to be maintained at a certain level, your core temperature, your blood pH. What about just doing enough exercise to maintain your health? So the green zone is you're doing enough exercise, you're going to optimize your health span, and in later life you're going to have compressed morbidity. That's the best you're going to do. Most people are to the left, are in the red zone, sitting down, doing insufficient physical activity. Now you've got inactivity interacting with the aging process, and now you've got an uncertain health trajectory, increased morbidity, and certainly non-optimal aging. What about the athletes I was talking about, the master athletes? They, this thesis says, no, they're not going to age any better. They may be capable of amazing athletic performances, but they're already in the green zone, assuming they don't overtrain. No additional benefit to aging. So how do we study people in aging then? So we say, we need to study people who are in the green zone. They're free of inactivity. So how do we know how much? Because I've told you we don't know. Well, let's take a decent guess. So we studied a bunch of OAPs, optimally aging phenotypes, who happen to be cyclists. So entry criteria, they had to be able to complete 100 kilometers in six and a half hours. That's quite a lot of exercise, okay? So we're comfortably in the green zone. For women, it was slightly less, and this is their average training distance. So we measured in, in the laboratory, that's uh, Norman on the bike there again, doing lots of different things, and this is their cardiorespiratory fitness. Okay, this is the index of your fitness, how much oxygen you can consume. And what that is saying, that goes down with age. Now, it's in liters per minute, that's why women are lower, because we haven't corrected the body weight at this point, or body mass. But we can say now, in this model of aging, these people are all the same. They're all doing the same amounts of exercise. So a difference or a decline is due to aging, not due to the fact that the older people are less active. Now, to make things fair, we do normalize the body weight. So Mo Farah will have a VO2 max of around sort of 85 mils per kilo, right at the top there. It's brought, the noise is very there, it's substantial. Again, there's another issue we could talk about. Aging data is noisy. People can be, have similar levels of function and be any age. But what we did here was say, okay, well, how does it compare to sedentary populations? This is a red line showing the slope of a big meta-analysis of sedentary people. So just for fun, let's say, let's take an 80-year-old cyclist, see where they hit the sedentary curve, age 45. That's a 35-year functional advantage that the cyclist has. Or if we turn it around and say, that 45-year-old is 35 years off where they should be. That's the point. When we look at the muscle, so these are muscle biopsy samples. That's a 79-year-old muscle biopsy sample. There is nothing wrong, there's nothing that a histopathologist could identify to say that muscle is from a 79-year-old. So I showed you some bad quality muscle earlier. Indistinguishable from a young muscle. That's an MRI through 
an 83-year-old cyclist. There's no sarcopenia there. They've maintained sufficient levels of physical activity. So it's teasing out an aging process from an inactivity process. It's not saying they're not declining. I've shown you we decline. But it's the rate of decline and the extent of that decline which we are accelerating by being inactive. These people are on the correct slope. What about muscle endurance? Okay, mitochondria, little organelles within muscle and all our cells that utilize oxygen. Just, this is not from our study, just to show that we're not the only ones thinking like this. Different components of the mitochondrial system. I won't tell you what they are. But what you can see on the open bars, they're young. The gray bars are in the old. Our typical understanding is there's an aging decline. In their study, they called them sportsmen seniors. You can see in the red bars, actually, they're even better off than the young sedentary. So here, you'd say, if you'd cut out the middle group, you'd say, well, getting older improves your mitochondria. OK, so again, it's all about what the perception of what we study, that the group that we study to draw conclusions about the aging process. This is a very quick slide to talk about the immune system, not just focusing on muscle. Immune system declines with age. This is a collaboration with the Professor Janet Lord's group in Birmingham, where we looked at our master cyclist shown here, the right hand bar, compared to healthy sedentary, if you can be healthy and sedentary, and young individuals. Basically, what this is showing is that the immune system, the age effects are either prevented, so in other words, there's no difference between the young and the cyclists. They're both better than the health, healthy old. It's either preventing or ameliorating those changes. So this assumption that everything's going down with age is not necessarily true. What about inflammation? That was the big problem. OK. They're not inflamed. OK, they are marginally higher, a well-powered study than the young. But you can see clear water between the blue and the red bars. So we talk about inflammaging or inflam inactivity. So resistance training remains the approach to improve muscle mass and function. So I'm going to show you two people. Uh, he might struggle. Maybe you'd get a perfect suit if he came here that was bespoke for him. Um, those two people are very different. They're both doing exactly the same thing. They're both doing high resistance knee extensor strength training exercise. He's doing it. Bodybuilding is uh, an event where you build muscle, and that's the idea to have this good look. He may be leg pressing two, uh, or doing that knee extensor exercise 200 kilos. I know she was doing four. It's still the relative amount was the same. She's doing it not to look like that, but to improve function. And it is the most effective means of improving function. Let's go on to the International Space Station. You take away mechanical signals. Muscle is exquisitely sensitive to mechanical signals. You take away those in, in microgravity. Astronauts are in big, big trouble. So what do they do? They take the magic pill that NASA has designed for them to keep them healthy, which of course doesn't exist. They take the poly pill, which is good nutrition, and two hours a day of exercise in the gym. That is the countermeasure. What he's doing here, the chap on the right, I can't call it weightlifting in a weightless environment, but he's performing strength training. As he was, it's the same strategy. There's no magic pill. John Glenn. Now we're on the subject of space, and of course we had the anniversary of the moon landings. So John Glenn, the first astronaut to orbit the Earth, back as part of the Mercury program, which preceded Apollo. Amazing achievement. What was more amazing was in 1998, not many people know this, that he spent eight days in space as part of the shuttle program at age 77. So the idea, how can we let a guy who's 77 into space? Because the physiological condition in which he was in was that not of a typical 77-year-old, but he was a very fit individual. And that allowed him to have the physiology to sustain himself during those challenges uh, of spaceflight. So some general conclusions. In most studies of aging, it's not possible to differentiate the effects of aging from those of inactivity, disuse, and pathology in most studies. Physical performance declines. We're not denying that. World records show us that. The trajectory of this decline may reflect the trajectory of our integrative physiology. We have this, the get up and go test and the six minute walk test as kind of physical tasks that are like that. If we study people who are physically exercising, they have superior levels of physiological function across the board and global health and mental health and well-being compared to people who are sedentary of a similar age. 
This gives us the impression that exercise reverses aging. It's not reversing aging. What exercise can do through activation of multiple biological pathways allows the body to age optimally. Even if you haven't been an exerciser, interventions of sedentary people have shown it's highly effective in improving function and health across, across even in very late life. Okay? No pharmaceutical can match the effects of exercise. This guy had it all summed up. Uh, we don't pl stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. So with that, I'll acknowledge numerous collaborators in some of this work I've shown you, and thank you very much for listening.